Thank you, discussion. Just a quick disclaimer on ACS's end. Our speaker, Amber C., had a family emergency at around 10 30 today and had to turn around the interstate going back to Chattanooga. So she will not be here. Um, I tried to find the professor at the last minute, but you know, everybody has their stuff. So, uh, Mr. Black, stuff. yeah, <laughs> Mr. Black is going to speak uh, on behalf of the Federal Society, and then we'll provide some questions that we had for Ms. C and see you know, how he frames the issue, and then we'll open up the QA. So um, that's that. And I'm grateful that they tried to get someone we'll do the best we can without it. And I'm going to offer a quick introduction here for our speaker, Professor Blackman. Uh, uh, he's a professor at South Texas School of Law. He's also an associate with the Cato Institute. Uh, he's listed recently on Forbes' 30 Under 30 for uh, law and policy. And uh, he's also uh, testified before the House Judiciary Committee on this very issue of this uh, immigration uh, executive order that came out from the Trump administration. So uh, he's pretty well qualified on this issue. And uh, last thing I'd add is this guy's a great follow on Twitter. You got Twitter, follow him. He's a great follow. At legal Josh M. Blackman. Thank you. Yes, it's a great follow. But without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Josh Blackman. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm grateful to be here back in Knoxville. I came here for a symposium of the Tennessee Law Review about three or four years ago uh, on 3D printed guns in the Second Amendment. And I'll tell you something, because of that article which I published in your law review, I actually got a paying job where Cody Wilson, the guy who actually printed these 3D guns, hired me to present him. And our case is before the Supreme Court right now. But I am not here to talk about 3D printed guns. I am here to talk about the travel ban. And uh, I'm sorry that Ms. Sihi couldn't make it, so I'll do my best to frame the issues as neutrally as I can. And I hope that you can all ask me questions and uh, take her place, although that's, that's probably not, not possible. Um, before I get to the travel ban, I'd like to discuss another case which you've no doubt studied in constitutional law, uh, Texas versus Johnson. This case considered whether a person can be arrested for burning an American flag. Long before people were taking a knee, they burned the flag, right? The decision broke down on five four lines, but to the surprise of many, the deciding vote was none other than Justice Scalia in favor of the flag burner. Now, Scalia was no fan of flag burners, as you can imagine. He once said, if it were up to me, I would put in, a, I would put in jail every sandal-wearing, scruffy-bearded weirdo who burned the American flag. But Scalia said, I am not king. Indeed, Scalia felt that the answer was compelled by the First Amendment, even though he disagreed with the result. Um, Texas versus Johnson is a good gut check for lawyers. If your understanding of constitutional law overlaps entirely with your own philosophical beliefs, you may want to reassess the former. This is much how I feel about the travel ban. Um, I'm a libertarian, and I generally favor open immigration policies. I think the idea of banning an entire class of aliens from entry simply because their countries have been associated with terrorism is an awful policy. Um, these executive orders will cause hardships to families, refugees, and others who are simply seeking a better life. Uh, I'm also doubtful that this policy would do much to improve our national security. Yet, with my cards on the table, I am firmly convinced that Congress gave the President the power to take these actions, and the Constitution does not bar him from exercising these powers in the manner in which he did. So my talk will be in five parts. Um, first, I want to talk about the history of the travel ban, including statements made by then-candidate Trump before the inauguration, and statements made by President Trump after the inauguration. Second, I will discuss the contents of the three executive orders. Now you have three, it keeps changing. Both uh, the first two of which have been halted by the courts. Third, I will discuss whether Congress has afforded the President the authority to take these actions from a separation of powers perspective. Fourth, I will discuss whether these actions conflict with the First Amendment, that is, the Establishment Clause. And finally, I want to give you a preview of what I suspect the Supreme Court will do in the case of Iraq and Hawaii versus Trump. So we really have to begin our story long before we have President Trump, long before we have Republican nominee Trump but back in December 2015. Then candidate Trump announced that he wants a quote, total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States 
until our country's representatives can figure out what is going on. Okay? That was the initial proposal, a flat-out Muslim ban. Over the next few months, Trump seemed to shift his position from a Muslim ban and move to what he called extreme vetting of people from certain U.S. territories. Or did he? Um, in a July 2016 interview on CBS 60 Minutes, Trump told Leslie Stahl that she can still, quote, call it whatever you want, but, quote, we'll call it territories, okay. Was that an actual repudiation, or was it a wink and a nod to the alt-right? A week later, on Meet the Press, Trump said to Chuck Todd, I'm talking territory instead of muzzle. Now, that's not a complete sentence. I don't know exactly what it means. But did he actually mean it? What did he mean? Or was it simply fake news, right? Um, these are usually statements that would fall to a fact checker, right? PolitiFact, to figure out what did Trump actually mean. But as you might know, the fact checkers go bananas with Trump because he contradicts himself within a single given sentence. It's very difficult to pin the guy down. After the inauguration, President Trump made some other statements. So for example, as he was signing the first executive order, he said, we all know what that means. Was he referring to protecting national security, which is what he was meaning, or was he saying, this is actually the Muslim ban with a different guise? On Fox News, Rudy Giuliani, who was an advisor to the president, made a statement that the president asked us how to do it legally, right? How to do what legally? A Muslim ban or a territory ban? Okay. Um, what all these statements should suggest is that figuring out what a politician, in particular a politician like Donald Trump, actually was saying is very difficult because he, again, contradicts himself nonstop. But this is not only the job for reporters and fact checkers. This has now been a job falling to the federal courts to determine what exactly was the president's intent. And can we determine his intent based on statements to the press, public re releases, or even his tweets, okay? So now I want to move on to the contents of the executive orders. And there are actually been three now. You should want to give this talk to everybody two. Actually, first there was one, and there was a second one, now there's a third one. This talk keeps getting longer, so maybe it's good we have only one speaker today. On January 27th, 2017, a week after the inauguration, President Trump signed the first executive order. And this order sent shockwaves throughout our legal order. For 90 days, certain aliens from Iraq, Iran, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen, seven countries, were deemed detrimental to American interests and would be denied entry at the border. For 120 days, the refugee admission program would be suspended. Syrian refugees in particular would be denied entry indefinitely. Okay. Almost immediately after the order was signed, chaos began. Airport officials were detaining nationals from those seven nations. And why don't you think about this for a minute. When you got on a plane, your papers were in order. As you crossed the Atlantic and Pacific, this order was signed. By the time you landed, this new policy was in effect, and you got trapped at the airport. This was a very bad way, a very, very bad way of launching a new policy without giving anyone any advance notice. In fact, the immigration officials had no idea how to actually implement this. So in what I have dubbed the airport cases, judges in New York, Virginia, Washington, Massachusetts, and elsewhere promptly ordered the release of people held at the airports. But this was only the beginning of the lawfare. Shortly thereafter, a federal judge in Washington issued a nationwide injunction barring the enforcement of the, this executive order. And in a fairly brief opinion, like about a week later, it was very quick, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals issued an order affirming the injunction so that the first executive order was put on hold. A petition for rehearing on Bonk was filed. It was denied. The government could have gone to the Supreme Court, but they didn't. They said, we'll try it again. So fast forward to March 6, 2017. President Trump signed the second executive order on immigration, and it superseded his first one. So the first big difference was it removed Iraq from the list. Um, it also made clear that green card holders, lawful permanent residents, would not be subject to the ban. If you're a green card holder, you have a vested right to come to the United States. 
The order also shifted the manner in which people were screened. <coughs> Rather than quantifying whether aliens from these countries actually engaged in terrorist attacks, which was, I think, always the wrong question, the new findings established that the United States lacked sufficient diplomatic relations with these six nations to trust their screening mechanisms. For example, Iran and Syria do not cooperate with the United States in counterterrorism efforts at all. Libya, Somalia, and Sudan uh, provide some cooperation. Yemen has been supportive of these efforts, but has not been able to cooperate fully. Right? So the, the, the new rationale for why certain countries were on the list is because we as the United States government do not have good relations with their country. We can't verify that people they're sending are who they say they are. Right? It was no longer necessary to say that these individuals are dangerous. Laws which were challenged again against this second order. Federal judges in Hawaii and Maryland issued again nationwide, effectively global injunctions barring the enforcement of these executive orders. These decisions were upheld by the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals and upheld by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And with that, the government decided now is the time to appeal to the Supreme Court. But they didn't appeal it all at once. They sought a series of emergency stays. A stay is a temporary order to put the judgment of a lower court on hold while the appeals process develops. <clears throat> on three occasions, three occasions, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled against the government. And on three occasions, the Supreme Court, in part, reversed those judgments. Now, they didn't give it, the government everything they wanted. Don't get me wrong, right? But they pushed back on the Ninth Circuit on three occasions. None of these cases had any dissents. Now, it doesn't mean all of the justices went along with this. One of the weird things about the Supreme Court is when you have an unsigned opinion, just because there are no dissents doesn't mean it's unanimous. What we do know is that Justices Alito, Thomas, and Gorsuch wrote a concurring opinion saying that they would have allowed the entirety of the travel ban to go into effect. So we know we, there are three votes in favor of the president. There might be a fourth, and there might be a fifth. So, the case was supposed to be argued next week, October 10th, at the Supreme Court. Oh, by the way, happy first Monday, everyone. Happy first Monday. Today is the first Monday in the October. It's the beginning of the Supreme Court's term. Happy first Monday. Uh, the court that was supposed to give arguments in this case next week, October 10th, I'm going to be there on October 10th. But there will not be arguments why the court took the case off the calendar in light of you guessed it, executive order number three, right? Keeps going. Um, but it's not only an executive order, okay? It's not only an executive order. It's called a proclamation. Now you may ask, what is the difference between an executive order and a proclamation? Um, nothing really, they're the same thing pretty much. But the difference is how they're announced. Now let me give you the contents of the most recent executive order which was issued uh, barely a week ago on September 24th, Sunday, so barely a week ago. The third order says we're going to now establish a baseline, right? Countries must meet certain specifications in order to have their people on the normal travel list. If they do not meet those restrictions, they're on the list. This is what we call identity management. So initially, 16 countries around the world were found to be deficient, and 31 other countries were found to be at risk of becoming deficient. After this review, the Secretary of State engaged with the countries to address any deficiencies, right, which resulted in improvements. Ultimately, the Secretary of Homeland Security concluded that a small number of countries, seven, remained deficient. So the good news is, if you're from Sudan, you're off the list, Mazel tov, right? Now, now you, your country has proven to the satisfaction of the government that your people can be admitted. The bad news is, three new countries were added. Um, North Korea, Venezuela, and Chad. Now, uh, North Korea, as you could probably guess, doesn't send many immigrants to the United States. It's a very small number. Rocket Man doesn't have a lot of tourists in this country, right? Um, Likewise, the Venezuelan ban doesn't apply to all Venezuelans, just certain people in the Venezuelan government. So for practical purposes, the only new country that matters is Chad. Right, so it's to me Chad, uh, Iran, Libya, uh, and Syria and Yemen. Uh, and again, we're stuck with basically majority Muslim nations. Okay? Um, after 
this order was issued, again, the court took the case off the docket and requested new briefing. So all of this discussion may ultimately be moot because if the justices decide there's no reason to proceed, let's just vacate the lower decisions, go back to the lower courts, that may happen. But I want to discuss in the abstract, right, what is the legal arguments here? Is the travel ban lawful? Okay. So our statutory analysis, we're always speaking with the statute, is 8 U.S.C. 1182-F. Right, 8 U.S.C. 1182. And this statute gives the president the power to deny entry to, quote, any class of aliens he deems detrimental to the interests of the United States. So if the president deems that a class of aliens will be detrimental to the interests of the United States, he can deny entry. This statute doesn't really put thresholds of what it means to be detrimental. The statute doesn't put a time limit on it either. It simply says, classes of aliens he would deem to be detrimental. Um, in terms of delegations to the president, this is very broad, right? It's Congress saying, we are giving you this power to deny entry if you deem a class of aliens to be detrimental. Um, generally, the administrative law, when the executive gets this sort of ambiguous grant of power, the courts are very much deferential to the executive and how he defines that power. Um, now, Trump has exercises power in a far broader manner than anyone ever before. Uh, I think we have to concede that. Um, the closest example I could find in the past was in the 1980s, President Reagan denied entry to all Cubans after some tip with Fidel Castro back in the day. He said, all Cubans are denied entry under this statute. Um, but it's never been used in this fashion for like, six or seven countries in one executive order. It simply hasn't been done in this fashion. Okay? Uh, but there are other statutes, right? The, 19, uh, sorry, the 1967 Immigration Act says the government cannot discriminate on the basis of nationality when issuing visas. This was designed to eliminate the so-called quota system where aliens from certain preferred European nations were given uh, 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 many more visas than other less desirable nations. So you can't restrict visas on the basis of nationality. Um, now, I don't actually see a conflict here. The President's proclamation is not revoking visas. It concerns the denial of entry. Entry and visas are different concepts. Uh, you may not know this, but when you come to an airport, an international airport, even after you land, you are not on U.S. soil yet. Okay? You are still in this weird gray area. Until you clear customs and make it through the checkpoint, you don't enter the United States. And if, say, if you come up to the border and you show signs of you have cholera or maybe Ebola, right? Guess what? You're not coming in. They'll turn you right around and put you in quarantine. And no, you don't get a lawyer either. Let's say you come to the border and you give some information to the agent and he thinks you're lying. And he checks your paper and your papers are fraud, fraudulent. Guess what? You're not coming in, they're gonna turn you right around and you don't get a lawyer. So being in this weird middle region, uh, uh, the mere fact that you have your visa, your paperwork, does not mean you have the right to enter the United States. Um, even if it is, and I, I, I'll concede this point, um, I think the president's inherent powers here do carry some weight. And even if Congress can't, I'm sorry, even if the president can't uh, use nationality in making decisions of who to give a visa to, uh, if he determines certain people are dangerous, he can absolutely deny them entry, irrespective of the visa program. But I don't think we need to go there. Um, so that's the statutory argument. The, the far more um, uh, interesting and sexy argument concerns the First Amendment and the Establishment Clause. So usually when we have Establishment Clause cases involves prayer in school, Ten Commandments display in a courthouse, right? Putting up a, a, a creche or a Christmas tree on a public property. These are the cases we usually see. This case doesn't fit into that norm. What the plaintiffs basically argue is that by issuing this travel ban, President Trump has shown a disfavor of Islam. He's shown an animus towards Islam and a favor of Christianity. And that effectively violates the Establishment Clause. They've argued. Now you may say, well, Josh, why can't you just bring an equal protection claim, right? They're discriminating on the basis of religion. Right, is that an easy, strict scrutiny, equal protection claim? The problem is aliens aren't protected by the Constitution the same way that people in the United States are. There's no case law whatsoever saying that uh, the equal protection clause applies to the aliens. Simply, that case law doesn't exist. You say, well, no, Josh, what about due process? Don't they have a, a property interest in coming to the United States? No, they don't, right? Visas are basically grants of grace by our country. They're not 
um, certain circumstances, but generally they're not a property right you can sue over. So what the argument basically is, is we're going to use the establishment clause to say that domestically Trump's decision to exclude Muslims shows to Americans in the United States that he disfavors their religion. Right? I want to see the argument. It, it's a weird fit for the establishment clause, and I've always seen this as one of due process, not really establishment, that the president's actions lack any rational basis because they're motivated by animus, like in Romer. I think that's the correct way of seeing this case. I don't think it's an establishment case at all. The evidence is exactly the same, the analysis is the same. But let's take the establishment clause for what it is. First question, does the establishment clause even apply in the immigration context? The answer is probably not. And for evidence of that fact, there's a lot of cases where immigration law embraces religion. I'll give you an example. We had a statute in the book in the 1980s that said, if you were in the Soviet Union, and you were an evangelical Christian or a Jew, you got priority placement for visas. The statute actually said Soviet Jew or evangelical Christian. Can you imagine a domestic statute that gave benefits to Jews and Christians in that same levels? My God, they'd be sued in five seconds. But we've had the statute in the books for decades. We have a special class of visas for pastors that if you're a member of the cloth, you get special treatment when you're applying for a visa. Um, it's been in the books for decades, right? No one's ever asserted that this violates the Establishment Clause. Um, if you ever deal with asylum law, right, there's a serious question of does this person face a, a risk of um, persecution on the basis of his faith, right? Those are hard questions that require judges to really make tough decisions about what is and is not the doctrine of a person's faith. No one's ever asserted that those amount to Establishment Clause violations. So I respectfully submit that their Establishment Clause is just inapplicable here, and there's no Supreme Court authority saying that it is. Now, maybe the justices will say, you're wrong, Josh, it applies. Okay, then I'm wrong. Uh, but at the present moment, I think I'm still right. Okay, let's say I'm wrong. Let's say the Establishment Clause does apply to the immigration context. Are President Trump's orders unconstitutional? So this invariably requires a discussion of statements made before the inauguration and statements made after the inauguration. Um, I think as a threshold matter, the statements before the inauguration are simply off limits. Um, candidates on the trail lie. They lie a lot. They make lots of promises they have no intent of ever keeping. Exhibit A, Obamacare, right? Um, the mere fact the president promises something in the campaign trail to pander to an audience doesn't in any way tell me how he's going to lead once he's in office. And there is zero precedent to the effect that you can look at campaign statements to rule against a president. Now, statements after the inauguration, I think, actually can be fair game. In other contexts, I've argued that those statements are relevant. Um, but I think the problem here is that when dealing in the sphere of national security, the Supreme Court has instructed that a rational basis review is all that's required. And one of the cases, a case called Kleindienst versus Mandel from the 1970s, says when you're reviewing the decision to deny entry to someone, you, you check for two things, facial legitimacy and bona fides. And the way I read that standard is that facial modifies both of those items. And so long as on the face the government has a legitimate reason, that's all that's needed. If the government asserts we're denying entry because our countries lack good diplomatic relations with these nations, that's it. And you don't peek behind the curtain. Let me give you the facts of that case, I'll illustrate it. Uh, a guy named Mandel was a Marxist. He was a professor, I think, from Belgium. And he wanted to visit the United States on a tourist visa to give lectures at different universities. You know, universities love Marxists, they always did. Uh, who didn't love Marxists? Richard Nixon. And the Nixon administration said, we're not giving this guy a visa. now. They didn't deny him a visa because he was a Marxist. They were actually a little more smart than that. They said, look, this guy, like, 10 years earlier overstayed a visa. He didn't tell us what he was doing. They found some, you know, trivial immigration offense. They said, because of this, we're going to deny you the visa. Now, does anyone believe that was a real reason? Of course not. The case was 8 to 1. And the court said, look, we don't look behind the curtain. We're just going to uphold this because a legitimate reason was given. Uh, Justice Marshall, Thurgood Marshall, dissents saying, look, you guys, Hey, five seconds, look what's going on here. They're denying him a visa because he's a Marxist. That's a violation of the First Amendment. The justices did not go along. If that's our rule of decision, I think that is our rule of decision, 
we don't look at President Trump's statements after the inauguration, which I think are at best <coughs> ambiguous, but we don't look to them because there's a facial legitimacy. And once you limit yourself to facial legitimacy, this has more than a rational basis to survive. But I want to focus on that phrase, rational basis, for a minute. Right? Generally speaking, in the national security context, the courts are deferential precisely because they don't have all the information. The third proclamation specifically states that there's information we're not making public. And there might be reasons why these seven nations are on the list that we simply don't know. Um, these are temporary bans. They can be reviewed every six months. And it's possible that countries come off the list. But you look at these nations, a lot of them are war-torn. Two of them are state sponsors of terror. It's frankly unlikely they will. So what all of this, I think, boils down to is, do we trust the government, right? Are they simply making up this entire elaborate ruse to harm Muslims? Or is this their good faith effort to protect national security? Uh, perhaps what we disagree with, but is this an effort? Um, pundits and, and analysts can argue at length about whether this is the real reason they're acting. But under the Supreme Court's precedence, the lower courts have grossly erred, precisely because the government has given them adequate reasons. And this third order, far more than the first and the second, I think eliminates any remaining taints, any vestiges of our religious animus. Um, I think the justices understood where this is going because on three occasions they pushed back on the lower courts. And they've made rulings saying that the Ninth Circuit didn't quite get it right. I think, and I remain convinced, that there are eight, I'm sorry, not eight, there are five votes for sure uh, uh, to rule in favor of the Trump administration, at least in part. Um, perhaps the answer here is the president has too much power, right? Maybe Congress should repeal Section 1182F, which gives the president this power to deny entry, right? If this is such a uh, power that's subject to abuse, and I think it is, repeal the statute. Uh, but I think the president's acting under his lawful authority, and under the prevailing precedence, the president has the constitutional power to do this, and nothing in the Bill of Rights stops him from doing so. I will stop here. This is usually where I would turn over to my good friend who, who's not here at the moment. But I hope you guys can hit me with questions and we can keep the discussion going. Uh, so thank you very much, and I welcome your, your input. I just actually want to make sure to provide one quick question. Mm -hmm. My question is about substantial effect. Mm -hmm. Now, there is some case precedent about discrimination um, with a, on its face, you know, non-discriminatory statute or provision that has a discriminatory effect. Um, and so I'm wondering now, uh, you mentioned a couple statutes that have said that they do not discriminate for immigrants on the basis of nationality. Um, and several of these executive orders have eliminated language that suggests a discriminatory effect because of religion. If you look at Trump's statements in the past, his campaign speeches, and I know you just said that this is off limits, but if you look at the whole picture in terms of the substantial effect and discriminatory intent, what kind of questions does this raise about is there a substantial effect of there being discrimination based on religion, even if that's not on its face, um, what the law says, what the order says? Thank you. Um, so the question we didn't hear in the back was substantial effect, right? Is there uh, based on the totality of everything that's happened the last what, two years, is there enough evidence to show that this is based on animus? Um, so I, I, have a, I have a couple of responses to that. Um, if we take the position that because of what Donald Trump said in the campaign trail, he is disabled from acting against Muslims because everything he does is infected with, with animus, then this administration is going to be really rough, right? What you're effectively saying is the president can't take foreign policy decisions if it affects Muslims. And a lot of our Middle East policy will do exactly that. But let me answer it a little bit differently. There have been three orders, and each order has, I think, gone out of its way to eliminate the vestiges of the past. Now, the first order had a reference to protecting minority religions. It didn't say Christians, but it said we want to protect minority religions. And a lot of people understood that to mean Christians and Muslim nations. But it didn't say anything about Christians. Uh, that's out. The second executive order, I think, was pretty neutral except for one passage, which I think was a screw-up. There was a reference to honor killings, right? It, it made some reference to honor killings. It didn't even involve anything, but it made a reference to honor killings. 
Honor killings are something that predominantly happens in Muslim nations, right? That's out. Um, at this point, I think the government has made a good faith effort to articulate why this is justified by national security rationales. Um, I don't think you can claim at this point that this is simply a Muslim ban. Even if the president had this intent earlier on, I think enough steps have been taken to uh, 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 attenuate that taint. Um, the flip side of that is we have what's called a forever taint, right? That the president is forever disabled. Um, and this would not be limited to um, uh, issues affecting Islam. Uh, recently, a lawsuit was filed concerning DACA, the Deferred Action Policy. And the New York Attorney General, in his complaint, cited statements Trump made about Mexicans. Remember, murderers and rapists building a wall, talking to Jorge Ramos and telling him to get out of the room, right? Um, if you start looking at every dumb thing that Trump has said and done, um, he's pissed off everybody, right? He's shown a, a, a prejudice, with the exception of perhaps white men, he's pissed off every group in the United States. Um, it's true. Uh, if we take the position that this renders him a bigot in all facets, he can't be president. And, and maybe that's ground for impeachment, and I'm sure many people will celebrate that. Uh, but that's not a license for the court to basically hobble his presidency for the next three and a half years or so. So thank you for the question. Yeah. Uh, in the front row, yes, sir. Uh, I was just wondering, you, you mentioned uh, just, you know, if, if um, the Equal Protection Clause does apply to non-citizens in the same way that it does, then we can't necessarily take uh, President Trump's post-inauguration speeches with the same, you know, um, validity as his pre-inauguration campaign speeches. However, he is still running for his next campaign. Oh, I see. So it's always in the campaign trail. Is that your point? Well, he's opened up uh, donations for his next campaign. In fact, he's actually had active rallies for his next campaign. So how do you distinguish post-inauguration from uh, pre-inauguration? At this point, I think he's president in the next four years, no matter what he says. I, I think everything he says once he takes the oath is, is, is fair game. All right. But to, to your point, yeah, I mean, the, the guy's always campaigning. <laughs> yeah. He hasn't stopped campaigning in two and a half, two and a half years. Uh, but I think at this point, once you take the oath, you are the president, and your statements are a matter of public record, and it's fair game. Uh, in the context of, 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 the, um, uh, of the travel ban, though, uh, uh, the foreign policy implications make it a little bit different. Take, okay, thank you. Other questions? Uh, yes? So before you reviewed the evidence, did you think the same way that you do now, or did you change as you researched the topic? Well, to be honest, I researched this about a year ago. Um, even before Trump was elected, uh, I thought there was a 0% chance he'd win the election, right? I, I truly did. I think people would agree with me. Uh, but I've been researching immigration law for a while, and I came to the conclusion about the statutory authority even before the election happened. Um, the stuff that happened afterwards, I think, uh, uh, specifically the, the stuff after the, after the inauguration, didn't help the president's case, and I think the president's been hurting himself in, but as a matter of statutory authority, I think the president has his power, and under the precedence, the statements aren't relevant. So did it change my opinion? Um, no, because I don't think those statements are, are admissible. Thank you for that. But I, I mean, I researched this a long time ago, because I, I wrote an article in, um, shortly after the Indiana primary called Donald Trump's Constitution of One where I listed all the various things I think he's going to do that would be illegal. And I didn't list this because I thought this would actually probably pass muster. Other question? Uh, yes, sir. So, um, so I guess the first part, if you read 1108 U.S.C. 1182F, it says the secretary shall direct consular officers not to issue a visa to any person whom the secretary finds. So, and that, when I read that, that to me says any persons, not a whole nation. So this <coughs> actually seems that it's overstepping its boundaries and denying visas to people. Well, the key phrase is visa, right? 1182F, which is the other statute I mentioned, says denies entry. Um, you can deny entry to a class of aliens even if they have valid visas. The provision you read is about issuing new visas. Now, here's the intersection, right? This, this is the rub. If you're going to be denying entry to people, why would you give them a visa? In other words, if a person's going to show up at the airport, why would you bother giving them a visa? It's basically, hi, you show up at JFK Airport, okay, that's nice, turn around now. The way the government has instituted the 1182F is by simply not giving visas to those persons, right? Um, the, the, the statutory framework is a little bit intricate, but this is how the government's been implementing this for, for, for decades. And if you can't be admitted, why are we giving you a visa in the first place? Make sense? Yeah, I'm a little confused. So yeah. His basis for not giving visas 
or for for denying visas under like 1182F, right? No, well, the basis for denying entry is 1182F. Okay. So he, and and in order to enforce 1182F, they said we won't give you a visa because you can't get in anyway. Okay. And that that's been the government's policy before Trump. It basically. If we determine that you are a class that can be denied entry, we're not going to give you a visa that's going to be worthless. Okay. But under the third executive order, this is actually worth stressing, uh, no visas will be revoked. So if you have a visa, you get to keep, if you like your visa, you can keep your visa, right? You, you can keep the visa you have. <laughs> Government promise is not good for much, right? But you can keep the visa you have, but you're probably not getting a new one issued while, while your country is under this ban. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, so I was more Lindsay major in undergrad, so I guess I kind of have a different, like, view of this. So religion in other parts of the, like, religion basically outside of the U.S. is a lot different because you have people that are also ethnically their religion. So, like, people that practice Islam predominantly look a certain way because their religion, like, is also part of their ethnicity. And same thing happens with Judaism. So, like, to me, you can't actually ban seven countries who all are ethnically Islam as well as like, uh, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, no, no, it, it's, a good, it's a good point. So, so well, one student asked me, a student asked me a different school uh, from a school, and he asked a question like, he said, what if you had an Arab ban, right? So instead of banning people who practice the, the, the faith of Islam, you just ban all people who are of the Arab ethnicity, right? Um, that would be problematic, I think, because the statute doesn't give the power of the president to deny uh, 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 necessarily based on an ethnicity, it's a class of aliens. And the easiest way to define a class is by nation by nation, right? Um, but more to the point, I don't think it's problematic that a, uh, uh, people say, oh, what about Saudi Arabia? Well, yeah, I mean, Saudi Arabia sent 15 of the 19 hijackers, right? We, we can all agree to that. But also, we have pretty good counterterrorism relations with Saudi Arabia. Um, with Syria, we have none. It's a country that's in shambles, right? In Iran, we have none. But if this executive order was just Iran, Libya, and Syria, and said these are really messed up countries, we don't, we can't trust people come from there, you know, I think you can even make the case just like this. But they've put forward a 20-page document list in case-by-case -case basis. So, for example, Somalia, you can come to the United States on a tourist visa from Somalia, but not on a permanent immigrant visa because maybe their authentication is not as accurate. Um, there are lots of ways of doing this, and I think, again, this is a foolish policy, but doing it based on country makes less problems doing it based on ethnicity or nationality. I think that'd be far more problematic. I, I, in fact, if it was, we'll deny all Arabs the same way we deny all Muslims, I think it would actually be just the same uh, level of uh, unconstitutionality. Thank you for that. Yes, sir, in the back. So there's been a lot of discussion about the consequences of allowing a uh, federal district court judge to issue a nationwide Yeah, election. good question. So do you think, are you comfortable with that, or would you prefer some so, states so, to go directly to the Supreme Court? I, I will move from common law to CIFPRO, right? So <laughs> you know the nature of civil procedure. People wincing. I won't mention here, I promise. But the nature of CIFPRO is that you have a plaintiff and you have a defendant. And a judgment in any given case binds only the plaintiff and the defendant. And usually it binds them because you have a one suit another, you have service of process. When you sue the government, it's a little bit different, right? If I sue you know, the United States, I'll go down to the federal courthouse in Knoxville and I'll sue them here. Is that judgment binding on the government only in Knoxville, only in Tennessee, only in the Sixth Circuit, or is it nationwide? Traditionally, the norm was district judges would only limit their injunction to their own district, you know, the, the middle district of Tennessee or whatever happened to the Eastern District of Tennessee, wherever we happen to be. But recently, the norm shifted, and this changed during the Obama presidency, where you had uh, federal district judges, mostly in Texas, uh, issuing uh, nationwide injunctions against President Obama's immigration policy, his labor policy, whatever else. I think in certain cases, nationwide injunctions are proper, uh, especially with immigration. The Constitution says that immigration must be uniform, right? That's the rule, the uniform rule of naturalization. So I don't have a problem with the nationwide injunction for immigration policy. I mean, imagine this. You could land, if you're from Syria, at JFK Airport in New York, but you couldn't land at Bush Intercontinental Airport in Houston. That would be a disaster, right? I think you need a unified immigration policy. Um, but the logistics of having these nationwide injunctions are maddening, because it forces you to run to the Supreme Court right away. Right? Once that nationwide injunction's in, that's it. You gotta change your policies globally. Um, I suspect at some point the court will intervene here, 
And Congress maintained also by amending the rules of procedure. I think that's actually in their wherewithal. We have Rule 23, class actions, right? Usually you have to go through a, a process to bring additional parties into litigation. But with a nationwide injunction, you just, boom, done in, in a couple days. I mean, I mentioned the airport cases. You had judges in Brooklyn within a couple hours of the executive order issuing nationwide injunctions, right? The government hadn't even filed a brief. You had judges issuing nationwide injunctions basically from the bench. This is, this is heady stuff, this is significant, and it's, when it happens so quick, you don't quite appreciate it. Other questions? Come on. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Uh, President. Uh, oh, yeah, go for it. Um, the legal resistance, whether it's judges of the Ninth Circuit or Lawrence Tribe or whoever, they make uh, arguments that seem to be well, seem to stretch things a little bit, and I'm wondering if you think some of these people, uh, do they really believe what they're saying, or did they just believe their cause is so just that whatever fig leaf they can apply to make it uh, make it fly, uh, where are they at, really, do you think, in that regard? So, so the question was about the legal resistance, which is a term I don't think I coined, but I certainly have popularized. In fact, tomorrow I'll be speaking at the Faulkner Law Review in Montgomery, Alabama, about to fly in a couple hours, heading there now, on the topic of the legal resistance. Um, now, the first part of your, the second part of your question, are they acting in good faith? Absolutely. I, I, I really dislike arguments. Well, they're just making it up and they're acting in bad faith. Don't, as lawyers, don't make those arguments. Um, you're going to get burned when you do this. I think, generally speaking, lawyers are acting that they truly believe in their cause. Um, I think they're profoundly wrong about it, but I, I do think that they're acting in good faith. So. Uh, We'll keep our arguments on the level. But, and this is my last question, so pack up in 30 seconds, um, as people are trying to get out of here. Uh, the point I'll stress is the judges have been treating uh, President Trump unlike they've treated any other president. And I think they've made the determination that he poses some unique threat, some danger to the republic, and that they're trying to solve the problems. Uh, Justice Gorsuch said it best, judges wear robes, not capes. And I don't think you should try to be superheroes. Uh, because when judges take that power and they grandize that authority, they seldom relinquish it back. And I think the long-term effects of the legal resistance dwarfs whatever damage that Donald Trump by himself can do. And he's pretty ineffective as well. He's not doing much. Uh, so I will leave it there. If you have questions, come up. So thank you so much for your attention. And I'm really